Okay, so um, <laughs> first off, who am I? Uh, my name is Christian Allen. I'm the Unreal Evangelist uh, for Epic Games. Uh, I focus on North America. Um, and uh, the first thing I do as an Unreal Evangelist is I answer the question, what the heck's an Unreal Evangelist? And I joke that 30% of the time is explaining to people, especially Epic employees, what uh, an Unreal Evangelist does. Um, but really what I do is, uh, one, a lot of these kinds of things. I go to shows, I go to schools, I go all over the country, um, uh, well, and, and Canada, and uh, speak about Unreal, give introductions, give technology talks, do presentations. Uh, and then I spend a good chunk of my time when I'm not traveling doing developer outreach. Uh, so my focus in North America is on independent game developers, uh, all the way from the hobbyist all the way up to basically any game developer that doesn't have a publisher um, or a lot of money. They have a whole lot of money, and then there's there's people above my pay grade all the time. Uh, we do have five. Uh, there are five of us, five evangelists around the world. Uh, I focus on North America. We've got two now in South America. One focused on Brazil, and one for the rest of Latin America. We've got one in Europe. Uh, I believe we're we're currently hiring another one for Eastern Europe, so there'll be six. And then we have one that focuses on Australia, New Zealand, and Southeast Asia. Um, all of the more focused regions, like Japan, South Korea, China, have their own epic business divisions. Uh, the un Unreal Evangelists are more for just covering multi countries or multi states. Um, so it's my first time in Kansas City. My first time presenting here. I actually left Seattle on. Friday, I took a train down and did a presentation in Portland at that dev group. Uh, then I flew out to St. Louis, did a presentation there on Monday. Here tonight, tomorrow I'm flying to Boston. There's a event on Saturday called FIG, which is the something independent game festival, festival of independent games uh, in Boston. And so it's a combination of video games, board games, uh, all that kind of stuff. So uh, that should be fun. So. Um, so he's got his raffle giveaways. I have a couple giveaways um, that probably aren't all that exciting, but I got, got a couple t-shirts to give away. But the only way to enter in for my t-shirts, which he doesn't have, I know he doesn't have them, I'm the only one person, person with them, is to tweet at Sreeland, which is my Twitter handle, a picture of me giving this presentation. Um, uh, I give a lot of these, and before I started doing this, nobody would ever take pictures of me, and I have his pictures of this space, and then my boss never really knew if they were actually there, because I travel alone. Um, but you can follow me on Twitter. I talk mostly game stuff. I try to keep it pretty game focused. Uh, on LinkedIn, uh, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, Christian Allen. Uh, I'm the game designer on both Twitter and LinkedIn. I am the Christian Allen, the game designer, not Christian Allen, the MMA fighter. Uh, so generally, you know, the guy with the shirt off is not me. Um, and then I'm not going to respond to you on Facebook. So don't bother with that. Uh, so my background, um, I've been in the games industry uh, coming up, well, it'll be 18, 19 years now. Uh, I started as a modder in the late 90s working on a, a game called uh, Rainbow Six, making mods from that. I got hired uh, by Red Storm Entertainment, which is it became, just became a Ubisoft studio then, uh, where uh, I'll run through the games later. Uh, I worked there for five years, then I was at Bungie for a few years. Uh, then I moved to Warner Brothers Games, where I worked there for a couple of years. And after I left Warner Brothers, I started my own studio in Seattle, Washington, uh, uh, shipping our own titles for about five years. I shipped three games, one in Unreal 3 and two in Unreal 4. Um, and after five years of being independent, uh, my wife said I had to get a real job again, so I came to Epic. And uh, during that time, uh, working in proprietary technology at Red Storm, uh, Bungie, and Warner Brothers, uh, run my own studio, we ship use exclusively Unreal, and so I became an Unreal convert during that time. Sorry, my PowerPoint's been a little slow. Uh, as far as the games that I worked on, like I said, I started, uh, I, I got hired to work on Rainbow Six, that, that quickly changed, I moved on to Ghost Recon. Uh, I worked from worked my way up from assistant designer to lead designer to creative director on the Ghost Recon franchise, mostly focusing on the Xbox. Uh, at Bungie, I was the design lead on Halo Reach, uh, which did pretty good. Um, and I got that other Ghost Recon down in the corner because uh, they used, I actually wrote the story for Ghost Recon Predator, which I found out later uh, when I read a review of the game. I was like, this sounds really familiar. I wrote this. Um, so that's my PSP title. Uh, at Warner Brothers, I worked on Mad Max. I was on the publishing side, so I worked with George Miller and uh, Avalanche Studios on that. And then I worked on an early prototype of what would eventually become uh, Lord of the Rings, or Lord of the Shadows, or uh, 
and I have to say that very particularly uh, what I worked on there. And then my own studio, I work, uh, we shipped uh, Takedown on Unreal 3, uh, Epsilon on Steam, and then I made a game called Hotel Blind, which is a virtual reality simulation of being a blind person. And it's about as uh, difficult as it sounds, um, but it was very interesting to first game in VR. And then during that time, I also had my big break in Hollywood, where I was the game director for the After Earth movie franchise, where I got to work, I actually worked for uh, Overbrook Entertainment, which is Will Smith's company. Um, and as you know, the After Earth franchise with a, a, a really strong actor like Jaden Smith leading it, it's a blockbuster, blockbuster science fiction franchise. No, it, it totally tanked. Um, so that was my big break into Hollywood, and After Earth uh, flamed out, so yeah, that didn't work out. So that's okay. So um, let me just ask you guys, how many of you guys have actually worked in Unreal before? It's about half folks. Okay. Um, I want to talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Unreal Marketplace before I get in uh, to the um, into the the game itself and the blueprints behind it. Um, Unreal Marketplace. Has anybody used the Unreal Marketplace or the Unity Asset Store? Okay, a few more. Okay, Unreal Marketplace and Unity Asset Store are very similar to each other. They're a place where you can go as a game developer to obtain content to help you make your game. Uh, that may be art assets. That can be um, blueprint plugins that can be, or blueprint uh, asset packs that can be code plugins, um, music, all sorts of different things that you can purchase on the marketplace. Uh, everything on the on the Unreal marketplace uh, is sold by people just like you. Uh, a lot of them are game developers. They create their own content packs. Uh, they put them up for sale. Uh, one of the things that we announced and released in the spring is we had a game, Epic had a game last year called Paragon, which was a MOBA game that uh, uh, unfortunately we had to shut down. But we decided to release um, uh, originally what was about $12 million worth of assets, and as of yesterday just went up to about $17 million worth of assets because we had a new uh, content pack release uh, worth of characters, audio, effects, um, things like that. Uh, for free to the Unreal community. Um, and so what that means is you can go download these assets, uh, you can build games with them, you can use them for whatever you want. Um, for our free assets that are released by us, the only restriction is the only thing that you can use them for is in some kind of Unreal related project. So whether that be a game, whether that be your TV show, whether that be print, whatever you want to do, it just has to be used in Unreal. You can, uh, uh, the only other limitation on all marketplaces, you can't download an asset, change it for a little bit, and resell it on the marketplace. We don't allow that. Um, for all the other content that you actually purchase on the marketplace, you can do whatever you want with it. So if you purchase a content pack of music and you want to use it in Unity, you can export it into a space file to re-import it into Unity, do whatever you want with it. Uh, you own that content. Uh, one of the big things that we just announced regarding marketplace, and this gets back to content uh, creators using it, to help fund video games is that we change the ratio of uh, split from the traditional 30-70 split to an 88-12 split, which means that anybody selling content on our marketplace keeps 88% of whatever sold. We actually backdated that to the four years when the marketplace launched and paid everybody back uh, that amount. I don't know if you guys heard, but we came up with this, Epic has this game, it's a multiplayer game where all these people like jump out of a bus and, shoot each other a lot and it's doing really well. So that, that's allowed us to be uh, uh, pretty generous when it comes to the marketplace content. Thanks, Christian. Yay! <laughs> um, here's where I give a big spiel about what makes an asset flip. Um, I'm not going to get into that too much because we've got uh, some, some newer users. I'll give a reference article that's, that's a really good article on how you can use marketplace content to enhance your game and not just use it as a, as a what people tend to call an asset flip, which is generally something uh, that's referred to as a clone. Um, but what you want to do with licensed content is you should think about it as a way to accelerate your, your development. So think about what the core of the game or the project that you're trying to make, and then how can I use these assets to help me get there faster and more efficiently. Um, you know, uh, when I go back even three, four years ago, when I worked on Hotel Blind, which was the blind simulation of being a blind, the VR simulation of being a blind person, one of the reasons I made that game, it literally had no graphics. And the, one of the reasons I chose to do that was because I'm a game designer, and I don't know how to make art. 
Um, and so I thought, well, this would be a really efficient way to make the game, and it runs at 120 frames per second, so um, <laughs> that'll be a great way to do it. But now with marketplace content, and I'll get into a little bit what I've built so far, uh, you can do that. Uh, but what I do tell people is what you want to do if you do use marketplace content or any kind of licensed content in your game is you want to focus on your game's uniqueness. So if you're making a game that is, say, a temple rating game where you go to Mayan temples and you're trying to recover gold from Mayan temples, um, you want to focus on those Mayan temples as your key art asset. That's what you want to build and have your art team work on and make it awesome and that's what's going to be on the cover of your game. Um, you know, you might not need to go and build a bunch of unique rocks that go in the woods around your mine cow, uh, your mine uh, pyramids. Uh, so those are great, great examples of uh, ways to license and work this content. Another big thing that you'll see when I'm demonstrating is to be able to prototype with shippable content. And what that means is, generally when game developers start your prototyping, you tend to work in what we call gray box. So you got a lot of boxes, you got a lot of gray walls, textures aren't in it on everything. You build up your cool game, it's all built, and everything plays right, and you're like, cool, now I'm going to art it. The art team comes in, and they make all these high-res models, and now you're running at five, five frames per second, and you got to go start ripping stuff out to try to make it efficient. If you start with, market, or with content that's already game-ready, you can use that as a template for your team to build other assets. So even if you don't plan to, to ship with, say, one of our Paragon characters, you can start with one of our Paragon, Paragon characters it's already built, it's got all its materials, it's got all its effects, it's, it's got, uh, well, I'm not sure if it ships with lots, but you build lots out of it. Um, and then you can use that as a placeholder and then build your specific content to match all those budgets that are already built in. So if it's running at 60 frames a second with assets that you got off the marketplace, then your art team comes in, you swap out those assets for equal budgets, you're still going to be running at 60 frames a second. Uh, so you're, you're way far ahead of the curve. And then, like I said, you can sell content on the marketplace and make, make a good amount of money. So the reference project that I point you to if you want to find out more about how to customize marketplace assets to make your own, we have an article up uh, by Gunpowder Games on our blog. If you search for Unreal Engine Maelstrom, just search for some combination of that title. Um, uh, they have a great article on how they use a ton of marketplace content, uh, art assets, blueprints, all sorts of stuff to make their game. and but they made all the content their own content. So nobody looked at the game and said, oh, that looks like an asset flip. That looks, those, I think that rock right there might be on the marketplace store. Nobody, nobody felt that, because they customized the assets to make their game unique. Um, other things that we have is we have a learning tab um, on the marketplace. Highly recommend, there's, there's example projects. One example is Action RPG, we just released this. Um, recently, it's got the best name ever of an action RPG. Um, this is a game that was built to demonstrate uh, two things, two big things. Uh, one is AAA uh, development on mobile. So this is a high quality uh, mobile title. We've had other high quality mobile titles. Fortnite obviously is one. Uh, Lineage 2 is another great example. It's really big in South Korea. Um, but Action RPG is a, a good example uh, if you are going to, to develop for mobile on having a AAA quality game on mobile. The other thing it's, it's built to uh, be an example of is, is building a project that's a combination of blueprints and C++. So um, the blueprint system and code. Um, Parachest, which I'm going to show you in a little bit, is because it's just me and I don't know C++, it's only going to be built in blueprints. So mine's going to be a blueprint only project. But Action RPG was, was built to combine the two and kind of show you where, where it's, it's worthwhile to use C++, where it's worthwhile to use. So, parachess. Um, so the story is, as part of the presentation, is that I've been working on this game for a while. So I, I came up with this concept that I feel is a pretty cool gameplay idea. I'm going to pitch to publishers. So first I built my gameplay prototype. So I came up with this idea. It's a turn-based strategy game. So you have two teams. And each team, they have uh, six different types of pieces. A couple of them are duplicated. Um, and you go in turns, and the, each piece has a different kind of movement type uh, throughout the board, which is an 8x8, 64 point grid. Um, and you attack each other, and eventually there's one key piece on each side, we're going to call that the king. And if you capture the other uh, team's king, then you win the game. So that's the rule set that I, that I came up with. Um, I'm going to call it chess, because it's this cool new idea that I came up with, totally unique to my own. 
Um, now, this represent I didn't really invent chess. <laughs> but uh, he's heard that one joke already probably two or three times. But um, this representation of chess would, is, from a gameplay perspective, and functional perspective, is just fine. Right? I've got the different pieces represented by size and color. I've got the board and all that fun stuff. I can move them around, do all my fun stuff. Um, but it's lacking a little bit in presentation. So if I was standing up in front of a publisher or if I was doing a sales pitch on why you should buy my cool new turn-based turn -based strategy game and this was the gameplay video, people might be like, eh, that looks kind of lame and you know, not all that exciting. And especially if you have to give a gameplay presentation uh, to a game publisher and you're standing up there talking for two hours and this is what they're staring at the whole time, they're going to be really bored after an hour. So, with that, we'll get out of PowerPoint, and I promise I'm done with PowerPoint for the night. And we will look at Parachess. So, this is what I actually built. Um, and I call it Parachess because the, um, make sure I'm at my right resolution, uh, because the um, all of the assets uh, that you see in here are out of our free Paragon assets that we release. So, all the characters in here, all the materials on the board, all the rocks, all the trees. I think some of the rocks and trees might be out of our kite demo, uh, which was also free. Um, everything in this specific scene, except for the music, the music I bought off the marketplace, I think it was $50, um, uh, is from our Parachess demo. And like I, I mentioned before, I am not an artist. Um, I understand the concept of, of Unreal. I know how it works. Um, I've been a game developer for quite a long time, so I know how all that works. No, I don't want to import anything right now. Thank you. Just turn that off. Um, but by accessing the assets that come with this, and a lot of people don't, you know, they, they see characters and they're like, oh, just it's just characters. But it's not just characters. You know, you've got all your animations, um, uh, obviously all the materials that come with the characters, everything's very high resolution. Uh, you've got all your animations, all those fun things that uh, come with the game. Even the materials that are on this board are actually um, water materials, um, just because I thought that they looked cool. So it's actually underwater reflective materials uh, that I used on the, the board pieces. Um, and so it gets some nice movement and, and animation, and obviously the, the, the color and everything. Um, everything else in here, the skybox is a default skybox, the lighting is a default setting, um, all of the the, um, so the world assets, I just copied in, world assets, there's some trees around, there's some pieces from Paragon in to make it look cool. And uh, so the, the presentation of what you get out of using something like this is obviously a little bit higher. Now the gameplay is really what I'm kind of here to talk about. And the gameplay is pretty straightforward. It's chess. Um, so if you've ever seen chess, um, I can move my characters around. The game swap, swaps teams. I'm going to move that ball out of the way. We'll just pretend you didn't see that. Um, and uh, so it, it, it does all the things that, that chess can do. Well, it will. Right now, I don't have like winning in. I, I need to work on that. I'm going to move some characters around here. Run my little cheat code. So the characters can move around, they can capture each other. Maybe if I move to the right place, they can capture each other. Um, we've got death animations, uh, we've got little win animations, and all sorts of fun things like that. Now, one of the things that, um, that I talked about, let's see if I can get a, um, is prototyping with real assets. And one of the benefits from doing that is not just the budgets and all those fun things, um, but the actual gameplay elements that you learn. So if I had just been prototyping in that blocky uh, situation where I was using blocks to move everywhere, and I said, okay, when a you know a good guy cap a good guy captures the other someone from the other team, uh, we're going to play an animation, we're going to move the camera, we're going to show it, boom, blah 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 blah. blah. Um, the thing you learn from re using real animations is some of the animations, while they look very, very good, are very, very, very long. Because something that looks really cool, but lasts, say, I don't know, well, Corey does that, besides dance. But um, something that lasts seven and a half seconds when you're playing chess is 
way too long because the other player, you want to move, the other player wants to move. And then some pieces are animations are way too short. So something that lasts, say, half a second is way too fast because you can't even process how, what, you know, what's going on. So by using real animation set, you start to be able to see that and say, okay, well, you know, let's find some place in the middle. For this kind of game, we don't, it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, exactly the same every time, like it might be in like a multiplayer shooter, but probably I'm going to shoot for about three and a half seconds. It's kind of the upper range as far, how far the animations uh, go. The other thing that you aren't noticing is that if I do something like this, where I move my character and decided to kill the other character, you'll notice right here that when it goes back, right down here there's a queen standing, right? Once he's done dancing, I told you it was too long. <laughs> Right here, there was a queen standing right behind him. And you notice that camera, there was no queen in the way, right? Well, that's because what I do in the blueprints is every time I do those camera swaps, I actually hide the, the tile and the piece that's directly behind the place where the uh, animation is playing. And that's because I found, while I was doing that with real characters, is you have that cool animation, and then there's this other character standing right in front of your camera, and you couldn't see anything. Um, again, that's something that you get by prototyping with real assets. If I had just like, oh, I'll get the camera stuff later, like I won't even think about that, and I'll just get everything moving right, then I wouldn't have found, you know, the animations need adjusting, um, those kinds of things. Um, what I'm working on right now is uh, actually gamepad support, putting gamepad support in. And because I, I'm using mouse selection for everything right now, everything's nice and smooth, but next I have to get a gamepad where you don't have a mouse to actually point at everything you have to click through. Uh, so that's taking a little bit uh, of time. But again, I'm learning, okay, well, this uh, visualization is sort of washed out on here. They're actually green when you have them selected, and it shows you everywhere they can move, um, and everybody that uh, they can take, if they can take anybody. Um, but that works great when you're clicking around, but when you're using a, 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 a gamepad and actually having to move everything, uh, that doesn't work quite so well um, because you can't just click on things. So I'm, today I spent the day actually just testing out different effects for um, what it looks like to select uh, who you have selected, where you can move them, and things like that. So that's the basic presentation of what Parachess is. Now, before I get into the blueprints, and I'm run through this real quick, actually the next thing I was able to do, because of the way I built this game, it's built in with two blueprints. Uh, the whole game is two blueprints. Um, and they're built modularly, so the two blueprints communicate to e each other. Um, but once they're dropped into a space, all the logic is contained within the game board. That's how you can think about it. There's one uh, blueprint that's the board, and then there's one child blueprint that's all the piece, all the tiles of the board. But the cool thing about that is, I can then drop them into any environment. And as long as there's enough, enough space, um, I can just drop them in, and all of a sudden, I have a functioning new environment. It's going to play here for a second. In a second. So now we've got this abandoned castle environment. And I actually purchased this off the marketplace, I think it was $60, uh, on Monday. Um, just because it popped up as a new environment. And I was like, ooh, that's really pretty. And I went and bought it. And uh, it took me longer. They had a whole demo where the camera flew through all this and showed it all off, and I had to delete all that. It took me longer than it did to actually place my board in. Um, so that's just something to think about. Um, you know, if you are using a lot of marketplace assets and you're having things, see things coming in as chunks, is how to think about how you, you build your gameplay assets. But with that, let me jump into the blueprints themselves. Has anybody worked in blueprints at all? Okay, so we got a couple people. Most people haven't. So let me talk about, I'll have to adjust this a little bit for my last few uh, presentations. So this is my content directory. Everything from pretty much here down to here all stuff I got off the marketplace or some of the default content that comes with it. That entire game of Parachess is actually just the functional game part is built within this directory right here. So I've got um, animations doesn't have anything in it. Uh, some materials, I just made copies of materials that are like the highlight colors and the chessboard cover colors. Um, but the, the important part is the blueprints. 
And essentially right now I have three, um, two of these really run the game. The player controller just handles the inputs for like the gamepad and stuff like that. Um, but like I mentioned before, uh, the two blueprints, the, the blueprint of the board and the tiles are really what run the whole game. So what blueprint a, a blueprint or blueprints are. Blueprints is essentially just a coding language that's built over C++. So C++ is the coding language that the core engine uh, is built in. So if you go get the engine, you can get the source code for free and you can start writing all the code you want. But if you're like me, you don't, you're don't, you not a programmer, you don't know how to write code, that's what blueprints are for. They're not just for, the, for us, but really this kind of scripting language um, they had a version on Unreal 3 called Kismet. Um, there's more text-heavy ones called like Python. There's all these kinds of different scripting languages that are generally designed for people like me, designers. Uh, they can build content, but they're, they don't know code syntax or how to write code or anything like that. So um, this is what a blueprint looks like. And essentially, uh, what you have is this visual scripting language. Uh, that is class-based and generally event-based. So um, let me open up a simpler version of this audience. I'm going to open up the control player controller that I talked about or um, that I worked on. This actually, I uh, was working on this today. Um, I actually scripted all of this on Tuesday night. So what this does is this is uh, this is the player input for if they're using either a controller or the keyboard. So the default game that I built in, in chess is you use the mouse. So you click on a piece that's yours, and then it shows you where you can move. You click on another piece, it moves there. Uh, and I'll get into some of the logic of, of how it does that. But this is an example of a, a relatively simple blueprint script. Uh, what it does is we've got these events, which are the player input. So this is called select left, select right. On a gamepad, that's your D-pad left on right. On your keyboard, it's, uh, it's right and left. Uh, and basically what it does is it goes through this set of logic, from, generally runs from left to right, um, and it, um, well, I'll show you what it does. That'll be easier, how about that? Let's see, we go game mode, pair of chess. Change that, player controller, and play. <laughs> okay, so, like I said earlier, base version of the game, clicking through with a mouse works. Well, if you, if, you have a, if you have a controller, you don't have a mouse. So what I do is, if you have a controller or a keyboard, you can then click through the selected pieces. So if I click left and right, essentially it cycles through my available pieces, and if they have a valid move, it shows the valid moves, um, I can go left or right. Now what I haven't implemented yet is the actual selection and movement. So my next step is, now that I have all that selection in, I have to be able to indicate, which is going to be through this little effect, which you'll see, oh, is that not working? There's my effect little glowy effect that says, okay, now I have this guy selected, I can then, I'll be able to scroll through his available move points, move him to there, and then it'll reset and go to the next one. So all of that, all of this left, right, which I know it looks simple, this is the thing about game design, you do stuff like this and then people are like, yeah, you can scroll left or right, so what? Um, it's actually pretty ingenious, because you notice it never goes to where you can't move, it swaps, it goes north, and you go more north, it's, it's pretty cool from a game designer standpoint. Stuff I get excited about. Um, so basically what it's doing here is it's taking your directional input, um, it's finding the next tile in, uh, in order, whether it goes right or left, and it rotates right or left based on whether you're on team one or team two, because if you go right and then you swap board sides, you're going to be going the opposite direction. Um, it checks to see whether that piece next to you, uh, or your current selected person, is a valid place to move, i.e. you have a teammate in it. Um, and basically then it, if it's not, it goes down here and sets a bunch of variables and checks again. Um, and then it, it pre has scripting in to only check up to um, the highest piece you have occupied and the lowest piece you have occupied. And that's, that's put in to limit the amount of checks. 
um, because one of the things that's a little bit expensive with this game. Okay, so that's generally what a blueprint looks like. This is an example of a relatively simple one, does that left and right. Um, all of the logic for everything else is handled in the board and the, um, and the tile. So let me open those up. So the, the key to this is, is essentially you've got these two blueprints. And, and you can think of blueprints outside of the scripting language as a container. So they hold um, the script, which is what you saw the blueprint scripts, kind of what it's called. Um, and then they have other objects with them, which um, you can see in the upper left here. So we've got these components uh, within the blueprint. And actually, sorry, I'm going to open the tile blueprint. For blueprint, maybe. There we go. So this is the tile blueprint. So there's only one of these blueprints, and essentially this uh, guy is uh, a child of the board. So the board essentially makes 64 instances of this, lies them all out, and then you by a grid. Um, and you, so you've got 64 duplicates of this. So up here in the upper left, we've got our, our uh, components of what the physical assets that are contained in this blueprint. So we've got our base, which is called cube, because I never renamed the default. I just put a cube in and just changed the scale. Um, we've got a couple uh, effects. So when you saw those uh, the characters blasted in, in the blue and then getting killed with the, the red, uh, that's attached here. We've got the mesh, which is the character, uh, which you saw all changing. We've got two cameras, one in front, one in back, depending on which way you want to look at it. And then we've got that little glowy selected effect. Now, the, the key here is when you see those characters moving around and you see all those things highlighted, that is actually all just done on each individual tile. So when a piece moves from point A, from you know uh, tile 62 to tile 13, Nothing in the game is actually moving. Nothing ever actually moves in this game. All it's doing is essentially every tile looks like this. And when they're unoccupied, I hide this character. When it's time to move and I play the effect, I unhide the effect that's already attached. When it's time to kill someone, what I do is I play the death effect. I play the death animation on the character. Then while those two are playing, I hide them both. Then I play the move in effect, then I change the mesh of this character to be the other character, then I unhide this character, and then I play a little dance. So all of that is contained within the each individual tile, and that does quite a few things. One, it lets me just kind of go nuts on um, the cost of everything. I can have a ton of animations, a ton of characters, they can look really good. It's all really cheap, because there's no AI pathfinding, you know, there's no uh, anything like uh, any movement, uh, anything like that. Now, the next thing people, what people always ask when they see this, like, is it going to be like battle chess when they, when they fight? And I'm like, okay, well, that's going to be farther down the line. But I could do that. If my spaces were big enough, I could play a big enough effect to cover that, then move each piece to points here, have two of them, have them play synced animations, have one play a death animation, then play another effect, cover it all up, and reset the whole thing. It'd just take a lot more. It'd just take me some time. So, um, totally doable. Um, so, within the piece, you have all the logic um, that it needs to kind of uh, do its own thing. Uh, the first thing that we have is um, this is the logic for setting that skeletal mesh, that character mesh. Uh, so, basically, every time I move pieces or when I initially set up the board, uh, I basically call to the, the, the individual tiles and I say, okay, tile one, you're a rook, you're on team one, and this is, this is the logic that says, okay, tile goes, sweet, I'm on team one, so I'm going to come over here, then I'm a rook, and we actually have two rooks, because for him, we, or for the rooks, bishops, and knights, we, uh, I have duplicates, um, depending on which one it is. It, it sets their skeletal mesh, and it's going to autosave while I'm talking, which is very nice. <laughs> I should really turn that off when I do presentations, uh, especially just because I downloaded a 
all those new characters today, and it's running a little slow. So it, um, yeah, so it, it sets the animation, then it starts playing the, um, the looping default animation when they're standing there, so they're actually doing something. Um, and then I have some custom stuff in there. What I do for um, the characters that are duplicated, like the pawns, um, if you notice, uh, if we go back in and take a look at the pawns, again, it's running a little slow, I apologize. They're all standing together, but they don't look exactly the same. They're all kind of doing their own thing a little bit. Actually, that's the same animation just duplicated over and over and over again. And all I do is, right here in the blueprint, is I randomize the speed of that animation between 0.85 and 0.11. So I either speed it up a little bit or slow it down a little bit. By doing that, they all get out of sync and they all look like they're doing their own animation. Now, if you stare at them long enough, you'll figure out they're all playing the same looping animation, just in a little bit different. But those are some of the tricks that we use in game development to, um, you know, to make things more efficient. Because having them all have their own unique individual animation set, while it might be cooler, one, you got to make eight different animation sets, and two, all those animation sets have to be loaded in memory. This way, there's just one animation set, and it's shared. And I actually do the same thing for the uh, the characters that are duplicated. These guys all uh, share the same animation set with their uh, partners over here, but again, the times are just desynced a little bit, so it's, it's always a little bit different. Um, let's see. So, let's see, set the play rate, then I set all their animations, tell them what all their animations are going to be, um, and then we're good to go. Uh, let's see, I don't know why, so I need to delete that. Um, and then when, uh, when I change the pieces, when I bring in new pieces, I then have to set their little emotes uh, to the new ones. I do that separately, so that all their little dances and exciting stuff. Now that's the, the kind of setup and what happens um, when things, uh, when the actual meshes move around. Um, and so from there, I'm going to pop back kind of the board itself. So. The other thing it does is basically right here is the logic for when a tile gets clicked, when I click on those different tiles, it basically tells the board that, hey, I'm a tile and the player just clicked me, so do stuff. Now we have the board. So here's the board. Uh, this is what it looks like when it's not placed in an environment. And the board is literally an empty blueprint with 64 of these children um, tiles. Um, they're actually built through um, through a function. So I didn't actually place each individual 64th tile. I could have done that. Uh, but instead, I came up with the math of how they're, how they're arranged. So essentially, it places, it spawns one, sets the size, spawns the next one, sets the size, and it does that 64 times. Um, then it labels them all based on their location. Uh, and then it gives them their initial setup information as far as what team they are. Uh, so it kind of tells each tile where they are, where they're supposed to be, and what they're supposed to do. Um, it, it, it does all that for them. And then they kind of control everything themselves uh, after that as far as what they're actually doing. The reason I set it up like this is so that I can be as modular as possible. So after I get all this finished and I'm like, sweet, this is like, looks super awesome. Now I want to do something actually besides chess. And I want to do Star Trek 3D chess with three different layers. I can take this logic and be like, OK, add layer two. And then start doing 3D movement. Or you know what, my chess game is going to have 10 rows. Um, I can also do things like you know, maybe in a certain environment. Like all these other environments work really well because they are built to what we call the Unreal uh, scale, which means they're built to the same scale as um, as the default character that comes with uh, Unreal, which I highly recommend. Um, but if I decided to get, say, maybe an alien landscape pack, and it, the scale was just like really weird, and I wanted to make everything just bigger, um, I could just do that through my scripting, just scale everything up. Um, and this is an example of, this is a desert environment. This is another environment I purchased. Um, but you can see, again, by having this modular uh, pack or this modular blueprint that I built, 
if I want to go, you know what, that kind of spacing looks cool, but let's go ahead and delete this. Now there's nothing, and I think over here would be like way better. Um, or you can just pretend I bought a new environment. So I'll just go over to my content, and I'll drag a new board in there. And it's going to generate a new one, and boom. Uh, now there's one over here. And oh no, I put it down too low. So let's move it up. I don't know why my camera thing is like taking up my whole screen. But we can move it up in the air. And then now it's up in the air. So that, I mean, aside from like looking around and figuring out where to place stuff, that's literally how long it takes me to put stuff in an environment. So I can get an environment, drop them in, and just keep rocking and rolling. So the board itself, uh, once this is the construction script, this is what runs to build, uh, to spawn all those child uh, actors. Um, we've also got the, the cameras. Oh, and I've got uh, music is actually attached to this. Um, in the actual event graph for this, what the board keeps track of is essentially all the chess rules. So you can think about the tiles do all the the heavy lifting. They do all the character animations. They can, can, can contain all the effects. They do all that fun stuff. The board does the part that I didn't realize how hard it was going to be. I decided, like, hey, I'm going to make this game with Paragon assets, and I want to make a game that already exists so that I can just design around the rule set. And I really should have chose Checkers. That would have been like, way easier, because you saw the logic for everything that, that moved. This is the logic here for the camera swaps. This is some default stuff. And down here is all the logic for chess pieces. Here, here. And it is relatively complicated. So this is a queen. She does all these different checks. Each one of these checks is actually eight different checks run on every um, on every piece. So remember when I talked about trying to keep things cheap earlier? Because a queen runs eight checks on every tile just to go north. Then she runs eight checks on every tile to go south. Then she runs eight checks on every tile to go uh, diagonally uh, in four different directions. So I think that's eight by eight times eight by time, eight times eight. It's like six eights times 64, whatever that, that ends up being. It's a lot, a lot of checks over time. Um, but that's how I'm doing the math uh, to, to make sure that I get all the movement right. Because I wanted to be able to build a system, again, that was, was coherent and flexible uh, for chess. And it, it actually, it kind of cracked me up that the knight actually, I thought she was going to be the hardest, but the knight's actually the simplest because she doesn't care about who's between her and the piece she's moving at. She doesn't have to check in between. She can either move there or not. And so her check is, is actually just checks each one of those little L's that goes check that one, then check that one, then check that one, then check that one, then check that one, and okay, you're done. And you can move or you can't move. So nights were pretty easy. So the board does all this fun math, uh, figures out where uh, where you can move, and then it tells each one of the tiles what's happening. So essentially, once you uh, initiate a move, it goes through, and first it tells uh, all the tiles, like, hey, if you're not involved in the move, just be Go clear, like don't have any highlighting. Um, so that's where what it does here, highlights and, and clears everything else. Then it goes, okay, uh, everybody that's available to move, highlight yourself and show you're your available to highlight. Then once a move is initiated, it does the um, uh, the math to decide whether it's an, uh, whether it's moving to a piece. Actually, sorry, it sends the information to the two different tiles that are moved. It says, hey, you're moving away. Hey, you, someone's moving into you. Now, because it's chess, and if one piece is moving into another tile space, it means you're taking that piece. That's, that's like the rule of chess. Uh, once that happens, then the tile takes back over again. And now we're back right over here, where we do all those sequences that I talked about. So um, uh, basically, the command comes in from the board. Hey, somebody's coming in to move. So we check and we see, oh, that's the move away. Here, someone's moving away, that's nice and simple. Hey, someone's coming in, oh, there's nobody else here, cool, just move in here, awesome. And then that, and then if it's move someone and already someone's already here, then we get into the attack sequence. So we do our camera switches, we hide, remember I talked about hiding that tile that would have been in the way, 
Uh, we play the death sequence for the person, character, I don't know what to call them, piece that's already there. Uh, and then we play the attack sequence for the new character coming in. And then after that, we close out some variables, clean everything up, so everybody's reset, put everything back the way it was, and now we're ready for our next turn. So that um, is pretty much the kind of basis for uh, this whole game, is, is these two blueprints and how they communicate to each other. Um, one of the other good reasons about building it the way that this is built. Oh, and remember when I was talking about chess being complicated? So uh, this is just the logic for changing the colors of the pieces when they get highlighted. The one thing I haven't finished doing yet is the logic for kings. Because kings can do all their own stuff that all the rest of them can do. But they also have to keep track of everybody that can threaten them into any piece that they can move into. I didn't kind of take that logic into account when I built everything. So I'm slowly, where is it? Oh, where'd it go? Oh, wait, that's in here. Yeah, up here. This is the king logic I'm still working on. So it's kind of still a mess. Um, but the king not only has to do all his own move places, but he's got to calculate every single other move piece into any possible place he could move and highlight anybody that's a threat of him. So he's kind of backward. He does, he gets ready to move and then he basically runs a move check on every single other piece to check to see if they're a threat to him. So I could just trust players to like follow chess rules, but I really want to build it in so it's actually got all the rules built into it. So um, and hopefully I'll be able to teach my kids. So when you build your first game, and I always tell people like a great way to build a game is to pick an existing game and like build your own version of it. Like, Checkers or Uno, like like save chess and go for later. Like it's way more complicated than I thought. <laughs> um, so that's pretty much the overview of um, of Parachess and how it's put together in the blueprints. I know for some of you this has been kind of crazy amounts of just don't even know what you're looking at. Um, but I think the kind of key aspects is, especially for beginners, the biggest thing that people ask me is how do I get started. And um, one great way is a game jam, um, either one over the internet or a local one where you could go and there's going to be 50 other people like you in a room just trying to make a game in a weekend. Those are awesome. But next to that, you know, uh, is picking a, a relatively small game. I built all of this. Uh, I, I work on this part time, actually a lot more when I travel than when I'm in the office because I'm usually on the phone in the office. To build the initial setup of just getting the board all laid out and the characters all set up right and doing the death animations and all that fun stuff, took me about two weeks uh, at about two hours a day that I was probably working on it. The chess stuff took me about another two weeks, so probably the equivalent of building the whole thing and putting it all together and then implementing chess rules took about the same amount of time, which my boss kind of got mad at me. He's like, where, where are you going? Are you working on Switch for it yet? Because he wants me to put it on the Switch. I'm like, I'm still working on the king logic. And he's like, I think chess has already been solved, Christian. You don't need to solve it again. I was like, well, it has to work right before I do anything else. So <laughs> anyway, scope your projects. But you will learn a ton. You know, the next thing I have to do, I just got the controllers working, like I said. Um, I've got touch input, so I'm going to be making a, a mobile phone version. We'll be cooking that out. Um, and then I have to start building the actual menu UIs. So when you actually start the game, and it has the, you know, da 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 then I need to go back uh, back through and set up actually uh, not local multiplayer, so online multiplayer and make sure. I'm pretty sure I've got everything set up to be network safe because I know how to do it. Um, uh, but there's a lot of steps that you'll learn. Um, and again, I'm not an artist. Those are all assets I got off the marketplace. Even the stuff I bought, all these environments, I've maybe spent $300 on, on all the assets that you've seen here. So, um, which hopefully when your game is done and you sell it on Steam, you make way more than $300. So. <laughs> um, with that, um, I think we're right coming up to 7 o'clock. So um, uh, I think I'll take a break while you guys um, win stuff. And then uh, uh, if you want the shirts from me, you have to hang out till after the break. Um, but if you want to take off, uh, we'll do a Q&A after this. We can talk about the game itself and then any other just general Q&A. So. That I'll take a break and thank you guys very much. Cool.